of uh, Education Next. And Professor Peterson will be leading us through the main findings of the report that we're releasing today, Globally Challenged, Are U.S. Students Ready to Compete? That is co-authored by himself, by uh, Paul Peterson, Luca Wussmann, Eric Hanischek, and myself, Carlos Lasta Anadon. So without further ado, Professor Peterson, uh, over to you. Thank you, Carlos, and uh, thank you also for uh, helping us uh, prepare this report, uh, which is available on the Education Next website and, um, and also okay. on um, – it's also available on the website of the program on education policy and governance. So uh, if you want to read the, the whole report that uh, Carlos uh, – Alastra and myself, along with uh, Ludger Wissman and Eric Hanushek, have produced. Uh, you can go to uh, the educationnext.org uh, website. That's probably the most efficient way of getting this information. Um, so okay, I would like now to move to the next slide uh, and uh, begin the presentation just as soon as it's uh, ready. Uh, the purpose of the study is to uh, compare the percentage of students in the United States uh, performing at uh, the proficiency level as determined by uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Education's official uh, report card. Uh, the proficiency level performance in math and reading in the United States with that of uh, the uh, proficiency uh, level, comparable proficiency level in other countries. And uh, we also have information for the students in each of the several states of the United States. Um, okay, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, um, I want to emphasize only that uh, it's pretty widely accepted that uh, proficiency in math and reading is extremely important if we are going to uh, remain competitive in the world economy. And nobody has made that point more convincingly than the President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama, has said, we know what it takes to compete for the jobs and industries of our times. We need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. Uh, this is an extremely important issue, not just because of the current uh, economic situation, but as we look forward over the next decade or two, if we're going to grow at the rate that uh, we uh, hope that, uh, to grow at to uh, address the many issues that exist in our society, we have to have a powerful educational system that is producing a highly proficient uh, workforce. Um, so the methodology that we use in this study is uh, to look at two tests, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, known as the NAEP, and uh, the PISA test, uh, which is a test administered by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Now, the PISA test is administered to 65 countries around the world, the PISA 2009 test. And uh, the United States uh, participates in the PISA test, and it also uh, administers the NAEP test. So we can equate the scores of these two tests by looking at the PISA score that uh, is reached by students in the United States uh, who are deemed proficient on the NAEP. Now, the NAEP tells us uh, that 32% of our students are proficient in mathematics and 31% are proficient in reading. The equivalent PISA scores are 530 points in math and 550 points in reading. So if you score proficient in eighth grade on the NAEP, in 2007, you can be expected to score 530 points in math and in uh, two years later. 
uh, when you are in 10th grade. And if you're proficient in reading, you can be expected to score 550 points. So that's the way in which uh, the two tests are equated. Now, we're going to focus on math in this webinar because uh, uh, math skills are particularly important for economic growth. A variety of studies have shown, and our colleagues, Ludger Wisman and Rick Hanyashek, have been particularly uh, assiduous in exploring the importance of various kinds of skills for economic growth. And one of the things that they have found repeatedly in their investigations is that uh, math skills are the most significant for economic growth. So there's a very important substantive reason why we're focusing on math skills. And the second reason is that, that U.S. performance is particularly low in mathematics um, as compared to other countries. So it's the critical area, the area in which improvement uh, is especially needed. And then uh, the third uh, point is um, a little bit uh, uh, more interesting, I guess, because it's never really been mentioned uh, in the media previously, at least to, to my knowledge. Um, and that is that the NAEP proficiency level is set higher in reading than it is in mathematics. It's almost as if the National Governing Board for NAEP, like so much of the rest of the United States, seems to expect less of the students in the United States in math than it does in reading. As I showed you on the previous slide, uh, it takes 550 points to be declared proficient in reading, and it only takes 530 points on the PISA to be identified as proficient in mathematics. So that's a curiosity that we discovered in the course of this investigation, and some of you may want to ask questions about that as we go forward. I'll leave that topic to one side for now. Um, so just to summarize what I have been saying, we have data for the high school graduating class of 2011. We have data on them when they were in eighth grade from the national assessment uh, that was at last administered, uh, well, no, not last administered, but was administered to this class in 2007, and we have data from the program uh, for International Student Assessment, the PISA test, when these students were 15 years of age in 10th grade, uh, and that data was collected in 2009. So that's, that gives us information on the proficiency level of students, the percentage of students proficient uh, in the class of 2011, the class that graduated this past spring. And the, the, the main finding is, uh, it occurred to me just uh, the other day that um, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is uh, the point where um, the water freezes over. And so, you know, 32 has always been uh, a number that, um, a good science student in high school in the United States has learned pretty well, 32. Well, this number 32 uh, is a big number in this study because the percentage of students proficient in mathematics is 32%. And that percentage places the United States number 32 among the 65 countries that took the test. Now, in reading, um, it's 31% are said to be proficient. But just remember that that standard is set a little higher. So that doesn't mean that students are equally proficient in reading and in math. It just uh, happens to be the case that we find that 31% of the students are proficient in reading, given the standard that NAEP has set. Uh, placing the United States in 17th place. So, it, so even though it's the same percentage, relative to other countries, the United States is looking better in reading than in mathematics. So uh, here is the picture of all the uh, countries of the world, except uh, a few at the very bottom. 
and uh, all the states within the United States uh, in rank order. And uh, the green bar, uh, the green line across, and then there's also a green bar, uh, identifies the U.S. Uh, percentage. That's the 32%. That's set at 32%. You can see that line appearing just above the number 30 there. Uh, and so anything above that green line, uh, the performance is better. And uh, there's a lot of countries that are doing better than the United States, uh, 32 as a matter of fact. Uh, so let's look at some of these countries that are doing better than the United States, just to get a feel for what the data uh, shows. Um, well, Shanghai, 75% of the students are proficient in math, an extraordinary percentage. Uh, but of course, Shanghai is not a country, it's just uh, the most favored province within uh, uh, the, the China, within China, so um, you can't really make that as a direct comparison. But um, and and Korea, uh, I mean uh, Singapore is a small uh, city state, uh, so its 63 percent may not be interpreted as uh, uh, all that significant. But when you look at the Koreans, 58 percent. Remember the U.S. percentage is 32. Keep that number in mind. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is where we are. Korea's 58%. Finland's 56%. Um, Switzerland is 53%. Uh, Japan, 51%. Our friends to the north, the Canadians, are 49%. Remember, we're 32%, and the Canadians are 49%. 49% of the students in Canada are proficient in math as compared to 32% of the students in the United States. That's a pretty dramatic difference uh, for two countries that seem to be roughly at the same level of economic and social development. Why should that be? Um, the Netherlands, also 49%, Belgium 47%, New Zealand 47%, Germany 45%, Australia 44%. So these countries, all of them, are performing at a much higher level of proficiency. Now, within the United States, we find a great deal of variation. And Massachusetts, uh, my home state, uh, and so we're very proud of the fact that we're, we're number one among the states. 51% uh, of the students are proficient. Of course, if you look at China and Shanghai, which might be thought to be comparable to Massachusetts, Massachusetts being the highest performing area, it has many advantages, a high concentration of well-educated people, lots of universities, lots of uh, high technology, uh, a very sophisticated part of the United States, probably somewhat comparable to Shanghai. Remember that the percent proficient in Shanghai is 75%. In Massachusetts, it's 51%. Minnesota comes in second place. 43% of the students in Minnesota are proficient. It's significantly outperformed by 11 countries in the world. Um, Virginia comes is, is also uh, doing better than the United States as a whole, uh, but it's still outperformed by 17 countries. Texas, uh, 35%, slightly better than the national average. New York is worse than the national average, 30%, significantly outperformed by 28 countries. Now, I said the United States is number, ranked number 32, but in terms of uh, statistically significance, the ranking isn't, uh, it's, it's more like 25, I think it is. 25 countries are statistically significantly uh, higher than the United States. Um, so uh, New York is a little bit below the United States uh, average, and this is Florida, and, and then it's amazing that California, where Silicon Valley, where uh, technical skills are particularly important, that this state, which 10% of the U.S. population lives in the state of California, and yet the state of California has a deficiency rate of 24%. 
and it's uh, significantly outperformed by 36 countries uh, throughout the world. And then Mississippi is at the bottom uh, with 14% uh, are proficient, only 14% are proficient in mathematics. Uh, so um, you might say, well, you know, the United States has a heterogeneous population. Some people have made that claim. Not fair to compare the United States to other countries in the world who are more homogeneous. It's uh, not my view. I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in all countries, and there's no reason why ethnic diversity should lead to low performance in the United States. But for those who want to take that point of view, let's just look at the white population, the white students in the United States. What percentage of them is proficient? And uh, where would the United States rank if the white population were the comparison point? Well, white students are 42% of them are proficient. That's 10 percentage points more than the uh, it is for the United States as a whole. Um, so definitely, there's there's a point here. White students are more proficient, uh, but still, it would place the United States only 17 in the uh, rank number 17 when compared to all students in other countries. Now, I'm not comparing it to comparably advantaged students or that segment of the population in other countries, eliminating minority students that, that may be living in other countries throughout the world. This is a comparison to all students. That's what we decided to do in this study. So if you compare the white students in the United States to all students in, the, in these other countries, it's still only in 17th place. Um, so here is the comparison uh, fleshed out state by state, country by country but uh, putting the U.S. white student uh, proficiency rate as the point of comparison. Um, now, if you look at the individual states, and these slides are going to be available, so if you want to take a more detailed look at these slides, you can do that, or you can also go to the report uh, to look at figures uh, and, and explore this information in more detail if, if you're interested. But, uh, just going to some of the highlights here, uh, Massachusetts, once again, uh, if you only look at the white students in Massachusetts, 58% uh, of them are proficient compared to 51% for all students. So uh, Massachusetts uh, still takes uh, first place. Uh, it's not outperformed by that many countries elsewhere. Uh, so, it, you know, if you said, uh, uh, that all the students in the United States were educated at the same level as the students in Massachusetts, this would not be that serious a problem. So what is being done in Massachusetts if it were done everywhere? Uh, we probably uh, wouldn't be able to make the claim that we have a serious problem. We could always do better, but certainly that is a level of performance that many would find quite uh, acceptable. And it's sort of interesting that Texas also looks pretty good. If you simply look at the white students, this has become an issue in the current political debates uh, with the governor of Texas in the campaign. Um, but if you look at the white students, uh, it looks uh, uh, fairly good as compared to other states. Minnesota uh, ranks uh, also ranks uh, fairly high, 48% uh, proficient among the white students, uh, California does not look so high. Only 40% of the white students are proficient. That's lower than the national average, which is 42%. New York is about the same level. Florida is a little lower. Mississippi, only 24%. So it's not the case that Mississippi's ranking is so low just because uh, it has a large uh, African-American population. The white students in Mississippi uh, do somewhat better, but still, it's at a very, a very low percentage uh, are proficient. So, um, in other words, uh, you cannot attribute the problem simply to the ethnic diversity of the United States. Now, we also did another exercise. We only looked at the students who came from families where at least one of the parents uh, has a BA degree, a bachelor's degree, or its equivalent, to see whether or not, okay, so it may be that if we isolate in on those students who come from family backgrounds, which are favorable to learning, 
And then if you compare just those students to all the students in the other countries, well, then maybe we would look pretty good. It's not a very fair comparison because there's lots of students in other countries who don't come from families where a parent has a college degree, but okay, we're going to do that comparison, give the United States a great big break. Uh, and when we do that, we find that, okay, it's now in 16th place. It's not in 32nd place. It's now 16th place, but, you know, it's not in first place. You would have thought it would have jumped to the top, but it's only in 16th place. Um, and so there it is. You can see it laid out. Uh, how the United States compares to these other countries. And when you just look at the students in the United States who come from families where at least one parent has a college education. And then if you look zero in on certain states, uh, Massachusetts is uh, once again at the top, Minnesota, uh, Virginia, 50% uh, of the college educated are now uh, proficient, but only 50%, only 50% of the students in Virginia are uh, proficient in mathematics. Um, uh, among those students whose parents have a college education. This is remarkable. And the same is true in Texas. And if you go to California, uh, New York, uh, and you're only looking at the students from families where somebody's gone to college, only 40% of those students are proficient in mathematics. Uh, in Mississippi, it's 20% or less than that. So you can see uh, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a serious problem here. It's not just that uh, some families, uh, the parents aren't that well educated. It's not just that we have a minority population. It's a much more general problem than that. Now, there is another study out there that was done by um, AIR, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Phillips, uh, and he reports better results for the United States. Um, we uh, looked at uh, his work more carefully in a prior study of ours that's uh, cited in our report, um, but the bottom line is, is that his study looks at the performance of uh, students on the TIMS, another international test, but uh, the United States, when compared to this country that uh, took the TIMS test instead of the PISA test, uh, the United States looks a little better, but that's primarily because uh, the, uh, most of the advanced countries of the world, the high-performing countries of the world, don't take the TIMS test. The TIMS test is more for developing countries, whereas PISA is taken by both the most developed countries and the um, uh, uh, less developed countries. The reason why we're not lower on this list is there's a lot of um, uh, developing countries who are participating uh, in the PISA, but also on the PISA you have the high, highest performing. Most uh, every country in Europe is participating. Most of the high performing countries in Asia are participating in the PISA, and uh, most of the high performing uh, countries elsewhere in the world, such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, are are participating in the PISA, but are not participating in the TIMS. Many of them are not. So. It's, Pretty easy to look good if you just look compare the United States to the, the countries that, that participate in the TIM. So that's the main difference between our study and his. Um, now, okay, so just going back to the point we made uh, at the very beginning, uh, and I, I want to close here now so I give everyone a chance to ask what questions they might have. Uh, America faces uh, many challenges, uh, says Charles Best, uh, who uh, was the former president of MIT and uh, really uh, has paid a lot of attention to this issue. And, and he says, uh, I fear that complacency is the big issue. We're going to be hit by the full force of global competition. And uh, we, it, this is an urgent problem. Uh, and I think that this is the point of, that underlines this, this report. This is our primary motivation is to help establish a sense of urgency that we cannot continue to ignore the mathematical education of the next generation if we expect to be a high performing, a highly productive, a uh, constantly uh, more productive uh, society. Uh, we can't, uh, we, we have relied so much in the past on immigrants uh, coming into this country with high technical skills. Uh, it's harder to do that now because of uh, immigration restrictions. 
Uh, and uh, it's really unfair to our own students not to give them the skills that they need in order to compete in uh, a modern society. So what needs to be done? Well, the purpose of this report is not to say what needs to be done. The purpose of this report is to document uh, the urgency of the problem. Uh, the authors of the report have elsewhere identified a variety of strategies to improve school quality, but we do not want to uh, confuse uh, the issue here by uh, proposing specific remedies because uh, people will differ in their opinions as to what actually should be done, and we don't uh, want to uh, uh, narrow the discussion and focus the discussion on this or that remedy uh, in the report itself, though I'd be happy to uh, respond to questions uh, on that topic. Um, our main purpose here is just to document the, uh, the urgency of the situation. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and uh, once again, um, if you want to uh, uh, obtain the report, uh, probably the um, easiest way of uh, accessing it is to go to educationnext.org, and then uh, you can move from there to the more uh, the unabridged version of the paper, and the, the link is, is provided uh, on that website. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Peterson. We have about half an hour left, and we want to open it up for questions. We've already received uh, quite a few, uh, but please feel free to uh, send us by the uh, online tool um, further questions. Um, Professor Peterson will be addressing them. Let me start with something that something that has already been asked which is a kind of a technical question that is expanded at length, but I wondered if you could say something about who it is that takes uh, PISA and who takes it in the United States. Is it public schools? Is it old schools? Uh, is it a random sample? Um, and so on. Uh, well, that's a very good question, and I should have mentioned this uh, from the very beginning. Um, it's important to make the point that this is a representative sample of all students in the United States in 8th grade and again in 10th grade, 8th grade on the NAEP and 10th grade on the PISA, a representative sample. And from each of the states, it's a representative sample. And it's a representative of all students, whether they go to public school or private school. So then the reason why that's necessary is that the percentage of students that attend private schools varies enormously from one country to another. So to get a fair comparison from one country to the next, you have to include everybody. But that also affects your interpretation. You can't solve, you can't say, well, if we just would put everybody in private schools, the problem would be solved. Because these results are the product of both uh, the public schools and the private schools of the United States. Now, admittedly, 90% of the students in the United States are attending public school and only 10% are attending private schools. So we wouldn't in any way be able to solve this problem simply by improving the quality of our private schools. So the basic issue has to do with public education in the United States, that's where 90% of the population are going to school. Thank you for that answer. Um, another uh, question of clarification uh, as for the NAEP that maybe some of our audience uh, is not so familiar with. Uh, where do the standards of the NAEP come from? Where, what is this proficiency standard that we have been dealing with? Uh, what's the significance of it? Um, That's a very good question too, Carlos. And uh, in the report itself, we give you some sample questions. If you can answer those questions, you're proficient. I think I could answer most of them. Uh, but uh, you can take the test yourself to see whether or not you're proficient in mathematics and proficient in reading. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're reasonably, you know, they're not, they're not uh, simple. Remember, these are uh, the standards that are set by the, um, by the national government, by the U.S. Department of Education's National uh, Governing Board for, for NAEP. 
And the way NAEP does this is they consult a variety of experts and say, how much should students know in eighth grade in order to be proficient? And how, you know, how much should they know in math and how much should they know in reading? And so you have a wide variety of experts. And then you've got uh, psychometricians who try to translate that into, into questions. So um, establishing what is proficient is really sort of a, a a, uh, a consensus decision. It's not something that's scientifically determined. It's more that the society says, okay, this is what is proficient. And that's one of the reasons we've done this study is where you said, okay, whatever our definition of proficiency is, and we leave it up to the National Governing Board to set the standard, okay, they, they say this is the level of proficiency, and they tell us that 32% of the students are proficient. Well, is that good or bad? Well, if they set the standard too high, then maybe 32% isn't so bad. If they set the standard too low, then 32% is really even worse than it looks. Um, but uh, the best way to think about it then is, okay, put that standard wherever it is, and then let's see how well students elsewhere in the world are doing. And when you put that proficiency standard in, you start looking and you say, okay, that's 530 on the PISA, which we were able to figure out. If that's 530 on the PISA in mathematics, well, then how many students in other countries reach that 530 point on the PISA test? And we find that in Shanghai, 75% do, and in Canada, 49% do, and in, you know, in 32, you know, 31 other countries who do, do better than 32% than in the United States. So I hope that clarifies it, and if it doesn't, then I really suggest you go to the report and you can look at the questions and you can get a more, more of a feel of what the proficiency levels uh, is. Now, one other thing I should say on that is every state now has its own proficiency standard under the No Child Left Behind legislation. And only Massachusetts and a couple of other states have a standard that's equivalent to the NAEP. The NAEP standard is fairly high. It's a fairly rigorous standard. Uh, in both math and even more so in reading. And only a two or three states, uh, I uh, will be posting a blog post on this uh, in uh, next, early next week, uh, telling you exactly uh, where uh, more details on this uh, uh, matter. But the, um, the, the bottom line is, is that the state definition of proficiency in mathematics are much lower in almost all of the states of the United States. And in some states, they're incredibly low. Cal California has a very low one. Tennessee has an extremely low uh, standard. So uh, the, uh, the definition of proficiency uh, uh, that states have come up with are much lower than those that the National Governing Board. So the proficiency standard that we're talking about here is a reasonably um, I won't say a harsh standard, but it certainly is not a low standard. So having clarified where the PISA comes from and the NAEP comes from, we have a, had a couple of questions on how we can justify linking them both together, given that they, they don't have, uh, they know IT testing exactly the same thing. So uh, we have a question that says, NAEP is curriculum based and PISA is an assessment of mathematics literacy. How can you defend the link? And other analysts have found that math demanded by PISA is less rigorous than the math demanded by TIMS. How do we come into that discussion? Well, uh, it is the case that the NAEP test is, is more, um, a, uh, I'd say, a, a pencil and paper test uh, in mathematics. Uh, do uh, you know that uh, 24 divided by 6 is, uh, well, whatever it is, you tell me. Uh, but um, the, and whereas the uh, PISA test is more um, taking real world situations and trying to come up with answers to them, I actually think the PISA test is the more challenging test than the, than the NAEP test, but that's all a matter of opinion. Uh, it turns out that when you, uh, look at the TIMS test, which is more like the NAEP test, um, the, the, uh, the score that countries get on these two tests are very highly correlated uh, at the 0.9 level. 
Uh, I think there's an enormous amount of uh, controversy over over nothing, much ado about nothing, about the differences in tests. Because if you if you look at if a student does well on one test, a student is going to do well on another kind of test on average over large numbers of students. Any one student might not, but over a large number of students, yes, it will. And um, and if you look at countries that do well on one test, they're going to do well on another test. There's a very high correlation in the performance. Uh, so we looked specifically, uh, not in this report, but in the one that we did previously two years ago, which is cited in this report, we looked specifically to see whether or not you could see uh, any different pattern if you had relied on the TIMS test rather than the uh, uh, the PISA test. And the uh, once you uh, compare exactly the same countries, you see that you get very similar results. So I do not think that this is a significant problem. Now, uh, and um, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Lindra Wissman and uh, Rick Hanyashek, who have worked with the PISA data and the date data for many, many years and uh, know the ins and outs of both of these tests, uh, have reached the same conclusion that uh, the, these tests are uh, even though they have different slants, uh, they, the results that they yield are very comparable. One further question that we've been getting, and uh, due to the nature of these sessions that we uh, can't go into all the details of what's in the fuller report, and I would encourage members of the audience to go over it, is um, now that we've drawn this link, why are you so? Are we so interested in the proficiency uh, level uh, rather than more uh, than high levels of achievement? Uh, given that it may be argued that what's important for economic development is uh, uh, the high achievers and not just the, the ones that cross the proficiency bar. I said, well, why are we so interested in proficiency? Well, I, I like that question because. It's exactly the opposite question that we got when we released our report uh, last year. Last year we released a report where we only looked at the highest performing students. We looked at the percentage of students who were advanced in every country around the world, and we found out that the United States was, I've forgotten the exact rank, but it was about the same as the one that I'm reporting today, 32. It was uh, well down the, the list. Uh, maybe, Carlos, you can give me the exact number on that. Uh, but the uh, the percent advanced in the United States was 6%, whereas in many other uh, countries it was more than twice that amount. And, uh, in fact, the United States ranked, uh, I think it was outperformed uh, by uh, significantly by 30 other countries. So the, the results were essentially the same that I'm reporting here. So what we have are just what we are reporting this time is in part a response to the criticism that we got a year ago. There we talk only about do we have uh, uh, are, are the very best students in the United States doing very well? And we reached the conclusion that no, not in comparison uh, to uh, students in other countries. And so people said, yes, but you're looking at a very thin slice of the population, you know, the top 6%. That could be extremely misleading information. And besides that, the economic development of the country depends on many more people than just the highest performers. So we said, well, maybe you're right. So maybe we better take a look. And, and so we said, let's, let's, the, let's look at the percent proficient in the United States, not the percent at the advanced level of performance, which is a much higher level of performance than merely being proficient, and see if the story changes. Maybe the United States looks better in that respect. And uh, the answer is no. We get it, almost exactly the same story, and the story is certainly not one that is uh, looks very pretty. And we should say perhaps that in the current report, we also look at the latest data in the appendix, I believe, uh, in terms of the people at the advanced level. So in a previous report, that was the core of uh, our findings. Uh, but we also, um, kind of as an aside, we reported in the, in the report we're releasing today. Absolutely. The other difference between the report issued two years ago and the current report is the current report relies on the 2009 piece of data and the 2007 
uh, NAEP data, whereas the last year's report we didn't have access to uh, the most, uh, the piece of data came out the, the month after we released that report. So we wanted to update that report. And then we did take a look at the advanced level. I, uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention that, and Carlos, thank you for uh, uh, mentioning it. Uh, so that um, the, uh, if you really do want to look at the advanced, uh, the percent advanced in the United States compared to other countries, you'll see that the story that uh, uh, we've been telling you applies uh, equally there. Our audience seems to be very, um, very uh, engaged on this debate and also want to move further to the explanations of what the differences are. Um, and uh, the, we've had a lot of questions about uh, what different, what interventions or what policies uh, may explain part of it. But maybe we can start. Uh, Although that's not the core of this report, we can start with something that we've been asking ourselves that maybe explains part of the difference. And I'd like to get your view on whether you believe that students in different locations, um, perhaps states, uh, across states and also across countries, feel differently about math and whether that explains part of it and maybe uh, what, the, what that says about the higher standards in math uh, than in reading or in other countries compared to the United States? Well, um, this gives me an opportunity to uh, mention the fact that uh, starting this evening and continuing for the next two days, uh, here at uh, Harvard Kennedy School, uh, we are going to have a conference uh, uh, on what the United States can learn from other countries. And that will stream live. And if you want to hear a full discussion of this topic, uh, what is it that explains the variation among other countries? We're going to begin by uh, presenting the basic findings from this report, but then uh, we brought in people from uh, different countries around the world, uh, from Asia and Europe and Canada, uh, to talk about uh, the educational um, um, situation in their countries and uh, why they uh, think uh, their uh, countries are more effective than in the United States. We're also going to have some analysts who will uh, take the data from all countries and uh, draw some conclusions uh, based on that information. Um, so uh, all that information um, will be uh, available in a much more detailed way over the next uh, uh, two, three days. Uh, so the way to access that information is to go to educationnext.org and uh, go to my blog post. And uh, on that blog post, I believe you will find the uh, link to the um, uh, uh, streaming of that data, of, the, of that conference. So uh, that will stream live. And I think we'll be able to post uh, after uh, the event is over with as well. So uh, that's just a promotion uh, to address the question substantively. Um, is it, the question really is, is it the students themselves are the problem or is it the schools? Uh, is it some interaction between them? And uh, in my own opinion, and this is not the opinion of my colleagues necessarily, I think uh, the United States has done not figure out how to motivate students to learn mathematics. I don't think there's anything in the inherent in American culture that says um, this is going to be a culture that cannot learn mathematics. I, I just think it's we haven't learned how to create an educational system that motivates people to learn mathematics. Now, for one thing, we pay all teachers the same salary regardless of the subject they teach. And we know that math skills are in short supply. If you know your math, you will be paid better. And so uh, math teachers, it's very hard to recruit high quality math teachers into our educational system when you cannot pay math teachers any more than anybody else. Uh, we also probably set expectations too low for students in mathematics. Uh, the NAEP itself sets lower expectations in math than in reading. And that's a sign that our society as a whole is setting fairly low expectations. Students tend to think that they're doing quite well at math, 
they, they don't realize that they're really doing terribly. The United States is ranked number one in self-esteem when it comes to math, uh, and, and number 32 when it comes to performance. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, we don't set very high expectations. We don't have comprehensive examinations at the end of high school. Um, Massachusetts does have one of the best examinations at the end of high school. And uh, math, since that was put into place, uh, uh, performance in Massachusetts has gone up. Uh, are, are the students in, uh, in Massachusetts uh, coming from backgrounds that are more uh, conducive to, to learning? I think that's absolutely correct, but I think there's something about the educational system in, that, in the state um, where, very high, where higher expectations have been set than ever before. Um, is, uh, is part of the reason why that state shines. So further to these questions as for the reasons that are behind these great variations that we're finding, um, we're getting a lot of questions along those lines. Maybe there's a good example. Um, if math students are doing as well in math as Korean students, which I believe has a really high focus on math education, isn't it promising that it's doable in our diverse states and it depends on policies being proactive, setting high standards, etc. So what can, state, what can states learn from the immense variation that we see uh, across the United States and other countries, but also across states themselves? Well, you know, the Koreans, uh, we are going to have somebody from Korea that will speak to this at the conference. Um, uh, so it'll be interesting to hear what they have. Uh, this person has to say. Uh, the um, I, I think uh, Korea has three things going for it. One, it has an examination in high school that people take extremely seriously because it affects their chances in the marketplace and in getting into higher education. Korea is a deeply intellectual culture. It's a very serious. Uh, uh, education has been important to the Koreans for centuries, uh, probably more than any other country in Asia, um, something that most people in the United States don't appreciate. And um, I, the other uh, uh, aspect is they really have two types of school. they got their regular public school, and then they have private schools that many parents send their children to after school. So they have a huge after school program that is providing instruction in order to prepare students for these very challenging examinations that are so important uh, to Koreans. So could you take the Korean system and introduce that into the United States? Um, it would inevitably be modified given the, the particular uh, society uh, in which we live. We, we can't simply adapt uh, what the Koreans have put into place, but uh, it does what the, the stories that I take from this is that um, we should try to find ways to supplement the education that's ha happening within our schools, and uh, digital learning gives us an opportunity to do that uh, now in a way that uh, was never before possible. And the Koreans themselves are moving to digital education extremely rapidly as a way of uh, 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 moving up their performance levels. Um, and also I think we need to set very clear uh, expectations for students uh, and specific examinations uh, in, in specific subjects that you need to pass in order to uh, establish your credentials for going on to college. So um, although, as I said, it's not the focus of this study and it's the focus of the conference that we um, starting today and we'll have a, over the next couple of days and we'll be streaming live through the Petsy website. Uh, some members of the audience want to have your own personal view on what could be um, a good start, a good way of uh, shifting these sometimes abysmal results that we see for certain states and we have questions about charter schools, uh, money, um, the sharing of best practices across different states and the uh, common core examination, uh, um, common core standards that we 
seeing a lot of discussions about um, all over the country. So I wonder if, if you wanted to comment on any of them and how they can serve to turn this situation around. Well, you know, uh, the charter schools are uh, being tried out. Uh, we have 3% of our population in charter schools. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to discourage uh, exploration in that uh, area. I think it's a, a, we're making a useful beginning there. I think charter schools are, are very uneven. Um, it's not going to be a mechanism for making dramatic progress in a short period of time. I think digital education is much more promising because the possibilities for rapid innovation and, and rapid uh, improvement in the quality of instruction and even if you have a shortage of good math teachers, if you have just a few good math teachers that create fantastic courses that are available nationwide, um, then uh, students, regardless of where they're living and where they're going to school, can have access to some of the best uh, mathematical instruction so I, uh, and scientific instruction. So I think the opportunities to provide high quality instruction to every student who wants access to it uh, gives us an opportunity that we uh, should be um, uh, looking for the best uh, ways uh, to expand. Now that's going to require a change in our legal structure in education because right now in order to get a high school diploma you have to go to a specific high school in a specific district and take the courses from that school or else get the courses transferred from another accredited school. So. If somebody creates a fantastic course online and a student learns as much or more online than they do from a, an accredited course offered in a physical building, they can't get credit for it online in most states. The exception is Florida. In Florida, you can take courses from Florida Virtual School and apply them to your uh, high school diploma. There's a couple of other states in the West that are beginning to do the same thing. So, but that's what we need to do nationwide. We need to create uh, the opportunity for, pe for, for young people to decide, I want to take this course this way rather than that way. And then we could have a much more dynamic, flexible system, and I think that's the way to get the most rapid change. This is happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, it, it, needs to, it, it is the most promising avenue forward, in my opinion. Now, I won't say that's the opinion of my co-authors, uh, uh, we we don't try to make that claim in this report, so the report stands in the, on its own uh, legs. But if you just wanted to know my own opinion, that, that's the direction where I think uh, the the, uh, the most promise lies. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to have to uh, close in a couple of minutes, but I didn't want to leave us without going through um, what the size of these opportunity may be something that we haven't commented upon because in the study we provide uh, an estimation of how uh, turning this situation around um, what that would they imply for the U.S. economy and so on. So I wonder if you could say a few words about that. Um, um, yes, Carlo, thank you for uh, bringing that up because uh, uh, Luther Wisman and Rick Kanyashek have done a lot of uh, work on estimating uh, the uh, impact of school quality and uh, how much students learn on uh, economic growth. And uh, they basically say that if the United States could move itself up to the level of, say, Canada or Korea in terms of proficiency in mathematics, um, you would probably be able to get uh, – an improved uh, uh, increase, annual increase in economic productivity of about 1% um, a year. Uh, it, it depends a little bit on exactly what the comparison is. Now, you'd say, well, what's 1% increase in productivity? Well, we just remember now that we now get about three, in the best of times, and we aren't in the best of times right now, but in the best of times in the past decades, we've been getting about improvement of 2 to 3 percent a year um, uh, productivity uh, 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 growth rate. And if you could move that up one percentage point more, 
uh, it would generate an enormous uh, return uh, in the in the trillions of dollars, so that it really comes out uh, to about a uh, trillion dollars annually in the in the uh, economic uh, uh, in, in GDP. So uh, that's an incredible return. Now you don't you're not going to get that return immediately. It's only going to come once uh, young people. Uh, take their new level of skill into the labor place, and uh, so the, the biggest returns come uh, a generation later or more. But uh, if we don't make these uh, uh, changes in our educational system, while other countries do, then clearly uh, the United States' uh, place in the world economy is going to be greatly diminished in the future. But if we can make these changes, then there's every reason to believe the United States can be as dynamic an economy as it has been in the past. So thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Peterson. Um, thank you for leading us through the main findings of the report we are releasing today. Globally challenged, are U.S. students ready to compete? Um, you can find uh, the full uh, report online at the Program of, Ed and of Education Policy and Governance uh, Harvard uh, website um, and uh, on a link to it on Education Next and I would encourage all the members of the audience who have been so engaged with us um, to uh, follow the conference that we starting today uh, uh, live um, online from the PEPG, from the program's website and I would like to thank everybody in the audience and Professor Peterson for leading us through this great discussion and I would encourage everybody to join the discussion uh, on uh, the Education Next website and on the PEPG uh, website. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos.